para una revista el tomar la fotografía de a un magazine atardecer. commissioned me to photograph a sunrise for this I chose a place which I knew and loved, a vantage point in the Ayusco National Forest. I parked my car and waited for the dawn. When I recognized an orange-colored light down on the slope in front of me, my first thought was that it was a fire. But in the same moment, I saw a yellow-orange dome rising in front of me, the dome of a large object. It was no fire. It was an unidentified flying object, a UFO. When I realized that I had a UFO in front of me, I grabbed my camera, which I had put on the seat next to me, this was a unique opportunity. I was very excited. I wanted to be sure that the picture doesn't blur when I exposed it. So I put the camera on the top of my steering wheel, held it firm in my hands and pressed the trigger. That's how I banned the object on film. Just when I transported the film, the engine of my car died off. First it was shaking, then the lights went off. In this moment I shot the second photo, with a longer exposure time, when the object was moving upwards. Now I got even more excited jumped out of the car, leaned on its door to have a support and shot further photos before the object was shooting off with a high speed. This experience never let me off. Again and again I drove back to Ayusco 30 or 40 times. One day, about two and a half months later, the weather was bad. And when I came to the Ayusco area, I entered a fog bank. It was raining heavier and heavier. I turned the windshield wipers on, my headlights cut through the denser and denser fog, and when I came to a crossroads, I entered by mistake the wrong road. It took a while before I realized that I was on the wrong road, and when I was still searching for my vantage point, where I had my first encounter, I recognized an orange glow in the distance, the same glow I saw two and a half months before. I parked my car when the rain got even stronger, left it and climbed up the volcanic rock from which the orange glow shone through the fog. I got closer and closer before I reached the back of the hill and saw the object hovering on the other side across and below me and just 20 or 30 feet away. I hid myself. I was afraid to get closer. Sat there and did not believe my eyes. I could see everything, each detail of the ship, which was hovering there in the mists of the wood. One of the things I consider most important were my feelings. I had a mixture of emotions. I was very happy and afraid at the same time because I did not know what would happen. What happened was that I got to see the object very closely and I was surprised and I wondered because the object was very beautiful. I could see the whole dome. On the surface it had several cavities. They ranged from very small ones to ones with a diameter of five feet. 
and there were many of them. I was very happy to see all this. I could also see the red spots the ship had, and I could also see that the red areas were brighter than the yellow ones. I did not have my camera with me, so I tried to impress every tiny detail into my mind. It was all very surprising. So I went over the details of the ship for two or three times, still with a mixture of feelings from fear to happiness. When all of a sudden I felt someone touching my shoulder, and when I felt the touch I fainted, I knew I got caught. They knew I was observing them, so I was fainting. When I recovered, I first saw, and then I could hear, and at last I could smell, and what I smelled was the odor of the woods, and then I remembered what had happened. Once I remembered what had happened, I was shocked, because my clothes were completely dry. This meant that something else must have happened in between. Completely bewildered, I looked around. I looked down again to see the UFO, but it was not there anymore. It was completely dark already. I climbed down the hill on which I was, and I got to the road and finally to my car. It was difficult for me to find it, since there was no path down from the slope. Eventually I got into my car and turned on the lights, when I realized that there was another car parked in front of me, about 30 feet away, a red Volkswagen Cariba. From there, a young man came out, walked towards me, and when I put my window down, the guy said, Hello, how are you? I replied, Hello, I'm fine, thank you. And the man said, If you want to know what you lived through this evening, I will wait for you tomorrow, where the circuit in Ayusco divides in two. Be there at noon. El día de hoy te espero en donde se divide el circuito de la Jusco en dos. Ahí te espero mañana a mediodía y te explicaré qué fue lo que viviste la tarde de hoy. Se me hizo eterna porque yo quería que ella fuera. The night was eternal a, 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 because I wanted it to be noon already. Y I had so many questions and I wanted to know. When it was close to midday, I took my car and I drove over to the place which he told me. And it was a surprise to see him there, surrounded by about 20 little children. He was talking to them and I was wondering what he was talking about. In one hand he had a cricket, and in the other hand he had some grass, some vegetation from this place. And he was talking to the kids about the interaction of all living things on earth, and how wonderful this interaction is to keep all life going on. After he noticed that I was there, he gave the kids three balls to play with, and he started to talk to me, and he said, Look, Carlos, you will remember everything which happened yesterday, but it will take some time, because if you would remember everything all of a sudden, it would be a shock for you. But when you remember, you know where to find me.
In the following years, Diaz, now living in the valley of Tepetlan, south of Mexico City, was able to take several more spectacular pictures of these ships of light. But time wasn't right yet to tell the public and so he kept them for himself without telling anybody. A partir de ese día, but what he can tell you is that from this day on, he contado con una maravillosa amistad con estos seres. He has been having this great friendship with these beings. Una amistad que para mí eh, merece todo mi respeto. A friendship that is based on respect y todo mi cariño and all his love por lo que me han mostrado for what they have shown him de este nuestro maravilloso hogar of this our wonderful home nuestro planeta tierra our planet earth que como ellos me lo han dicho as they have told him es un verdadero oasis it's an oasis en el espacio in space Ten years later, the sun was darkened over Mexico. During the eclipse of July 11, 1991, thousands of witnesses saw strange craft in the skies. And one man, the prominent TV anchorman, Jaime Musan, got involved into the quest of his life. Well, there was a multiple sighting over Mexico. That day we had a total solar eclipse, an eclipse that occurs every 676 years. It's an eclipse of the series Sarus, and it's very important in the history of Mexico. We didn't know that at that moment, but what people knew is that they, want to, they were going to have a, a big show. They took their cameras out, and at least 15 people in Mexico City were able to record, besides the eclipse, a UFO hovering over Mexico City. This person, Guillermo Arreguin, took the video to uh, a newscast called 24 Hours that night, the July 11th night, and was presented as a strange object hovering over Mexico, but nothing else. Then, with that video, I, I went to the second program of Nino Canuno, and I asked the people, if you record the, the eclipse, please look carefully because probably there is the same UFO in your tape. We received more than 50 videos. In, in 15, uh, we think there is the, the UFO and we decided to check six of them and we got exactly the same kind of object. It means that uh, it, it is not the, the invention, it's not a hoax of one man, it's something that was in Mexico there. From that moment to now, I have been receiving videos from many people in Mexico, and so far we have collected more than 1,000, probably 1,500 videos. The, the Mayan Codex, the uh, Codice Dresde. In that Codex, we found that uh, there is a, a table of eclipse, and they knew that in July the 11th, 1991, that's more than 1,000 years later that was written this codex, uh, they knew that was going to be an eclipse on that same date. And uh, there was a prophecy, a very strong prophecy over this eclipse. It said that uh, it was going to be a big change in Mexico or the world. The new lords were going to come and the old lords were going to be killed or they have to leave because the new order was coming back. We were, they say also, that would be the eclipse of going back to the roots, to the Indians, to the indigenous. It was, it was named the soul of Quetzalcoatl. Also, it was named the sixth sun. The Aztecs were the sons of the fifth sun. We are the sons of the sixth son, and in the sixth son, besides the new order is going to come, 
we were going to found, we were going to meet with the lords of the stars. Uh -huh. I went to the television to present the, the solar eclipse uh, videos and exactly the, how we checked them in the computer, how we tested them. And then Carlos came to me on October the 31st, 1991. And he said, Jaime, I didn't see you in television, but many people told me that you were testing material. Would you like to test these photographs? And then he showed me four of the best photographs I have ever seen in my life. And I said, where did you take this? And then he started to relate this story. And I said, yes, I want to check the material. I think it's a very interesting case. And we will do it, but very slowly. That's when we started. On December the 3rd, just a month later, he asked me for a video camera. And uh, with, that, with that video camera, he uh, was able to record at least six videos that we have, and they are extraordinary. Besides, he has been uh, taking more and more pictures, and I think the evidences so far are that is one of the most amazing cases ever. We have. A mí me despertó. Yo salí al jardín de la casa. Again, I had this sensation in my solar plexus, as I always have it when they appear. I got up, it was 3.30 in the morning. I grabbed the video camera Mr. Musan has given to me. I went into the garden of my house when I saw the ship hovering over the city. In my first video, you see the ship over the north of Tepoztlan. I filmed it, and you can see how it hovers over the city, making these shaking movements. I filmed it without a tripod, tried to get reference points into the image when it suddenly disappeared. But I still had the feeling that this was not over yet because I still had this sensation in my solar plexus. I went out on the terrace of my house, set my tripod and waited. Suddenly it appeared again, this time much closer, in the direction of Santiago de Tepatlata. It was the second video I shot on the 3rd of December, 1991. In the next video, I used my tripod again. Therefore, all visible movements are those of the object, not of my camera. I again had this sensation and went out on the terrace when the object appeared in the sky directly above me. I wanted to extend the legs of the tripod, but I did not manage to do that anymore, so suddenly it appeared 
and as I lay on the ground, zooming in and out, and one time I knocked against the tripod. This time you see all details, the different fields of light, the changes of the intensity of the light, and the pulsating center of the object. I was able to zoom in so closely that the whole frame of vision of the camera was filled. So close was it. It was a misty day. The air was very humid. The light was shining through the nightly fog. Then Heime Musan asked me to fix the camera on the tripod and appear in the picture myself, so you could see that I don't have a model on a fishing rod or do any other manipulation. Also, he wanted me to let the camera run all the time until the morning, after dawn, when you can see all landscape details and reference points, so you can see it is indeed a large object. I put the camera into the open kitchen window of our house, because from there you have the best view over the football field, above which they appeared most of the times, and where I had my encounters and contacts with them. After I turned on the camera and made sure that it functions, I went out and took my flashlight with me, so you could recognize me in the darkness. When I still tried to make myself visible with the torch, it suddenly appeared over the football field. You can hear on the video how someone yells, Guamero, Guamero, come quickly. And you can see how cars are passing on the slope of the hill on the highway from Mexico City to Cautra. After a few minutes, the object disappears again.
Pero traigo el tripié, ayúdame, May. Con el tripié no puedo. Jaime Moussan commissioned the first scientific analysis of the Diaz material. The study was performed by Professor Victor Quesada, who teaches informatics at the Polytechnical Institute of the University of Mexico. Until this moment, I did not find any elements which could discredit the case. In my opinion, it is real, it is authentic. I have divided my investigation into two parts, laboratory research and a field investigation. The laboratory part consisted of video analysis and photo analysis. The video was analyzed as dynamic video and static video which means frame by frame. The tests included a study of the definition and the resolution, an analysis of the intensity of fields and colors and changes in the spectrum of light from ultraviolet to infrared. Some of the tests has been change of definition and resolution, change of the intensity of fields, like uh, from infrared to ultraviolet, and uh, and also change of the definition and change of spectrums of the light. Have been able to prove with that testing that the mach that the his ship is made of plasma. It's the same kind of plasma that we have in the cells. That tells us that probably it's a living ship. You know, it's something different, something we cannot understand. We have found two principal types of objects. The smaller ones, with a diameter of 36 to 45 feet, and the big ones, with a diameter of about 120 feet. Quesada was so impressed by the material that in 1993 he decided to start a field investigation. Together with 10 professors of his university and 20 students, he set up several observation posts on the mountains around the valley of Tepotzlan. And indeed, the team saw and filmed strange luminous objects by themselves. Sí, estoy grabando. No sé. No sé por qué, pero creo que metió la luz de la de la cámara en el ojo. La luz. ¿Cuánto tiempo lleva, Víctor? Lleva como dos horas. Y ya subió. Pero esta luz lleva ahí ya más de dos horas. Y voy a abrir el zoom. Todos pensamos que nos centramos en la luz. Margarita ya subió. Mis alumnos tuvieron una experiencia muy fuerte. My students have had a very strong experience. One night, an object nearly landed and many of them got really afraid, ran away and had several accidents. It caused a panic in one of the camps. We had to seize the project. I think more evidence than this is impossible to obtain. Oh, 
The first European who heard about the Carlos Diaz experience was the Italian stigmatist, Giorgio Bongiovanni. Bongiovanni, who claimed he received the marks of Jesus during an apparition of the Holy Virgin in Fatima, Portugal, believes in the existence of beings of light and for several times saw luminous objects in connection with his vision. Although they disagree about the interpretation of his experience, Diaz, himself a devout Catholic, allowed Bon Giovanni to show his material in Europe. Through Bon Giovanni, the German historian, cultural anthropologist and UFO researcher Michael Hesseman learned about the case and decided to start an independent investigation. When he visited Tepotsland the first time in June 1994, Hesseman was sure that if the case was real, he would find further witnesses who must have seen these large luminous objects over their city at the times when Diaz took his films and photographs. he found was more than a pittoresque Mexican country town. Tepoztlan is located in a sacred valley of the Aztecs, the great native Mexican culture. Its huge stone formations were considered monuments of an antediluvian culture of giants and vertexes of cosmic energy. The Aztec priests worship the rock of life, the rocks of the dwarves, the hill of a man, thought to be a portray of the prehistoric demigod Tepoztecatl, the son of the divine Quetzalcoatl, Hercules-like with his mighty beard and club. Next to it, on a ridge, the Aztecs built their only pyramid located on top of a mountain. It was called the Teocali, the house of energy. Here, history says the emperor Mote Kutsoma came to meditate and find peace after his military campaigns. Next to the temple stands a disc-shaped rock, like a huge petrified spaceship. Many believe it was a symbol of those worshipped and met here by the priests and shamans of ancient times. We find to its right the Cerro de la Luz, the Rock of the Lights. From here, since men can remember, as the locals claim, strange lights emerged and crossed the sacred valley, sometimes flying on the directions of the mighty volcano Popocatépetl, which rises to the east. Their paths were marked by ancient temples, later replaced with churches by the Spaniards, and they often appear on one of the numerous feast days celebrated in Tepoztlan all over the year as a fixed point of a sacred calendar. I think these lights are something very important because already our ancestors, our grandparents, told us about them. But in those days, they did not have much means to study them. It was considered normal to have them here, and I think they are here, as many people believe people who know, because this is an energetic point on this earth, because of its geological composition. So they come to charge their batteries, 
y realmente pues, nosotros lo hemos visto, así como nos lo platicaron nuestros abuelos, también nosotros lo hemos observado. I know they come because Tepotzlan has an overcharge of energy. They come to charge themselves with this energy. That's a long story, going back very far. I studied it since many years. This goes back to the time of Christ. In the ex-convent of Tepotzlan, next to the main church of the town, Santa Maria Natividad, erected in 1530, we find murals and reliefs showing strange objects in disguise. On the frescoes on the ceiling of its cloister, these objects are painted in orange and red. Is it a strange coincidence that they resemble the craft photographed and filmed by Carlos Diaz? In its neighborhood lies Amatlan, the place where, according to an Aztec legend, Quetzalcoatl, the plant serpent, the mythical hero and founder of the Mexican culture, came down from the skies, lived and taught his people. All this makes Tepotlan a magic place, an opening to the cosmos and maybe an entrance into another dimension. And it is right here where man, as the ancients believed, communicated with the gods and today a man claims to have encountered beings of light, visitors from a distant world or maybe a parallel universe. What form do the contacts happen? In qué forma suceden los contactos? Eh, a mí hay, hay una sensación muy especial que se me presenta a, a esta altura del plexo solar. There is a sensation concentrated in the plexus, in the solar plex of mm. his body. Es una sensación como cuando uno está fuertemente enamorado. It is a sensation very much alike when you are uh, tremendously in love. Y esta sensación me despierta. And this sensation sometimes wakes him up at night. Y sé que voy a tener un encuentro con ellos. And he knows he's going to have an encounter with them. Sí. Eh, lo que me agrada de, de esta experiencia que he tenido what he likes about this experience he has, he has had, es que la comunicación que ha habido con ellos, is that the communication they have been having, es como la comunicación que estamos teniendo tú y yo en este momento, is just as we are now. So it is a purely physical contact, es una absolutely physical. puramente física. Este, you bueno, can touch them. Los puedes tocar. Los puedo tocar. Y En ocasiones, ellos presentan un cuerpo de luz. Sometimes, as, as, as they are human-like, sometimes they have a, a body made of light. I have seen uh, the, uh, the UFO that Carlos has photographed and videotaped only once, and this was some years ago, five years ago maybe, and he called me when he got home and I went out and he showed me. So I saw the very same shape 
and the color wasn't yellow and red, but it was completely orange. And, but it was the same one, and it was traveling uh, at the south part of Tepoztlan. The first step in Hessenan's investigation was to determine if independent eyewitnesses exist, if others saw what they has filmed so closely over their city. He just started to ask people on the streets and fields. The result of his inquiry convinced the researcher that indeed something strange is going on. More than half of the Tepoztecos, the citizens of Tepoztlan, claim to have seen the very same orange ready ships of light. I saw these orange lights many times. They appear here and there, one time at 5 a.m., one time at 7 p.m. They are round, disc-shaped, and they have a flat dome on top. They have notches on their sides, like bitten out, and they are surrounded by light. Sometimes they are more yellowish, sometimes more reddish, sometimes they rotate. It was about 7.30 p.m. My daughter comes home from school at that time. I went to the corner of the street to pick her up. Then I waited for her. It suddenly appeared in the sky. It was very, very big. In the middle of this round, big thing was something moving. It looked like it would change its colors. I showed it to my daughter, but she only said, Don't look at it. Come on, let's go. But I wanted to see it. Its center pulsated. It was very large and round, very bright. It was yellow with orange light. They look like the sun. They are round and have many little lights. They are yellow, orange and white. And they appear and disappear. The light objects sometimes suddenly appear, fly and disappear again. Most of the time they disappear in the direction of the Tepozteco hill. Most people here have seen them. You will find that out when you ask in the town. One night we saw this light in the mountains. We observed it through our binoculars. It was very bright, pulsated in red and orange, but was mostly red. It looked like it had landed on a hill. It was a round object. For several minutes it stayed there, then it suddenly disappeared. We saw for several times these lights over the Cerro de la Luz. They were red and yellow and orange. They were round. We were driving in a car when we saw this big object, as big as a bus or a truck. It was very large. It was shining in a very bright, intense light, red and yellow.
It was around 7.30 p.m. when I saw a strange luminous object standing on the Cerro de Hombre. It was an orange-colored object, round, very, very, very bright, and very, very, very big. It was brighter and bigger than an aircraft light. It came down slowly and eventually lighted up the whole area where it was landing. It was staying there for 15 minutes. I was together with another sister of our order. It came, stood there, and suddenly vanished. It was orange-colored very bright, round, and big. It was hovering here above the trees, not too high, it was a large, orange-colored disc, and suddenly it disappeared. One time, during my training here, I saw such an object over the Cerro de la Luz. It had exactly the shape and the colors as on the photo. It was round and consisted of yellow and red light. I saw these objects several times over the rocks and hills, one time in this direction, one time over there, another time over Zematzin, always at night, one time at 8 p.m., one time at 4 a.m. Yes, they are identical. They have these red and yellow lights, and whenever they appear suddenly, all the dogs start to howl and bark. I saw this red-orange light two times in this direction, the third time over the Zematzin, in direction of the village Santiago, a little bit to the left. This was two months ago. The sighting lasted for about three minutes. It was gliding, wobbling, went up and down. Another time was at 9 p.m. My wife was there. My mother was there. We saw how this luminous object moved down slowly and jerky before it suddenly disappeared. All of a sudden, in a break of a second, it just disappeared. We were a group of people in a meditation class at a detoxication seminar when we suddenly saw this light in the mountains. It was very impressive because it was very large. It changed its colors, stood there for a while before it suddenly disappeared. We were all very impressed by what we saw. It looked like it were looking for a place to land. It had bright colors, and when it rose, they became more intense, and it grew and changed its colors. It was yellow and orange mixed, more or less like on the photos of Carlos. All of a sudden, it disappeared. Although I am a doubting Thomas, this is credible. Many people have seen these objects at different opportunities in different parts of Tepotzlan. They appear within a second. 
hover in the sky and disappear again. They look like on the photos and films, and this proves they are real. I had several sightings by my own over the hills, for example, over the Zematsin, the hill of life. The colors of this luminous object were very impressive. It was red and yellow. Also some violet was in it. It was very impressive. It was quite a big apparatus, an enormous object of light. En el mero cerro del Tepasteco, no es el Tepasteco, mira están saliendo varias, están meneando, aquí está, ya se apagó. No, 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 mire, están prendiendo, son una, dos, tres, cuatro. Me acerco otra vez con su. Ahí está, ahí está, ahí está, ahí está, ahí está, ahí está bueno, fuertísima. Es una bola y ahí está la luz, ahí está la luz. Es del mismo lugar la luz. Yo veo una bola impresionante con esto, eh. No, eso no lo necesito. Mira no, ahí. pero aquí se ve una bola. Estoy grabando. Ahí está ah, arriba, arriba, arriba. Otras dos, pero grueso. Ahí hay varias. Sí. Me voy a salir un poco de, de, de zoom porque son demasiadas luces. Yo ahora sí hay demasiadas luces. The largest airport of Central America is Mexico City's Benito Juarez International Airport. Its air traffic controllers receive radar data from a whole network of stations covering all of the highlands of Mexico, including the Sacred Valley. Hesseman decided to inquire there, and indeed the air traffic controllers confirmed that their radar regularly detects unidentified targets over the area of Tepotzlan and its neighboring city, Guarnavaca. We uh, have uh, uh, information about these objects in this area sometimes, very close to the volcanoes also, in Atlisco and uh, Cuernavaca. Cuernavaca is located here, approximately at uh, 35 or 40 miles south of Mexico VOR, Mexico Airport. And, uh, Sometimes we have activity there at this point. But it's near Tepoztlan. Yes, it's very close to Tepoztlan. We have uh, activity, more activity in this in this place than in other of the Mexico around this one. Oh. There. Yeah, I had it. This is what we see. See? We can put it in green. There it goes. It disappears. <laughs> comes and goes. That's what we saw. And that's the only what we don't have an explanation for that for that uh, because of the speed that they 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 appears to display. And what um, kind of flag here's another one, right? Oh, yeah. The white one? Yeah, yep, that's another one. What kind of um, flat characteristics uh, they seem to have? See like this with these two minus vectors this, air, this this aircraft or whatever it is is gonna buy in two minutes he could fly that right to here so we're talking about oh shoot. See, he was explaining like this he was talking about 13 or 14 miles in two minutes.
But Hesseman only believed it when he saw one by himself in February 1996. I was driving from Tepotlan back to Mexico City in a taxi when at the Ajusque area I saw an orange light hovering over the city. I immediately told my driver to stop. I went out, I got my camera, and I managed to film it for several seconds before it suddenly disappeared. I was very shocked and very amazed by it. My driver saw it too, and I wondered if it might have been an OVNI, a UFO. It didn't look like anything conventional to me. Thursday night at 8 o'clock. Last Thursday night? Yeah. Yeah, they were some around of Husko, I would say. Yeah, definitely there were. And, and, and even we had a report of um, an airplane that um, he asked us, in uh, he was flying this this way. He was fl coming from Mexico. He took off from Mexico. He was going to Guadalajara, so he should go. He went like this, going like this, and in this area, around this area, he saw a uh, very bright, bright uh, light that. Um, he was asking if that was an, another aircraft coming uh, toward, toward him. Um, we didn't have any other report that, that, that an airplane was coming. So we, we couldn't explain what it was. We started seeing some, some um, echoes, but we didn't see one in, exactly in front of him. He and another airplane who was coming also behind him going also to Toluca, saw the same light, and that's the area they saw it, around the Jusco area. Hesseman was not the only researcher who came to Tepotzlan to look into the case and witnessed the objects by himself. When uh, I went to Tepoztlan, well, it, it was with uh, Guido Ferrari of the Italian Swiss television because uh, Ferrari uh, had to um, produce a, a video documentary on UFOs and uh, we had uh, chosen uh, also an interview with Carlos Diaz for uh, our trip in Mexico. So we went to Tepoztlan and we had uh, a date with uh, Carlos in his uh, Tepoztlan house. And uh, uh, we arrived on the spot uh, at night and uh, so we left the car and uh, began walking towards uh, the house of, the, uh, of Carlos. And at that point, uh, I noticed on the roof of uh, the house, uh, well, on the roof, it was just on the roof in, in the sense that uh, the perspective showed it on the roof, I noticed a dot of light. It was something a little bigger than a normal star. And so I noticed it, I saw that this object was moving in an in unregular way, and so I said, Guido! What's that? And Ferrari watched and said, oh my God, are you seeing what I'm seeing? Yes, it is. And so, <laughs> at the same time, we cried, the cameras! And we ran to the car in order to open it and to put outside cameras, video cameras and so on. But it was too late because uh, in a half a minute or something more, this dot of light uh, switched off. Simply, it disappeared. It was in December 1995. I was visiting Carlos Diaz together with Roberto Pinotti and Daniel Munoz. It was evening, about 8 p.m. There were many stars in the sky and suddenly a bigger star started to move, which of course was strange, so we observed it for several seconds with an open mouth. 
The star was coming down like a falling leaf, going left and right and left and right, like a pendulum, but not symmetrical, and then it suddenly disappeared. I had the opportunity to show the plasma ship in Land in two different occasions. This was one and a half year ago, but one month ago we saw we have another site in our Teposland. Um, we were we was working in, with a TV crew from the United States when we saw a very bright light over the hill of light, maybe 20 seconds. Uh, was a very bright, very yellow, ready yellow in color just appear over the hill of light, covering the top of the hill with a very slow movement, and later it just disappear. Was very few time, just 20 seconds, but was very, very clear. It's exactly the same shit that we saw in, in the Carlos photographs and videos. The movement of the, uh, of the UFO over the hill of light was very slowly, like a pendular movement maybe 20 seconds and just disappear. Don't stop the movement, just disappear. Also Shirley MacLaine, the world famous Hollywood actress, heard of the case and decided to go to Tepotzlan to meet Carlos Diaz in person. With her was her friend, a high-level Australian politician and UFO investigator Alex Gionetti, a friend of hers who served as a translator. In direction to Tepotzlan, we was heading in, in the freeway, the freeway what uh, the freeway connects Cocoyoc with the Postlan, and, uh, and suddenly we saw high in the sky this kind of oval orange object, who was very steady, but very radiant, very shiny, orange, very orange, and it's a light I never saw in my life. The four in the van was very astonished and uh, suddenly the object started to shrink, it started to contract. And when it was contracting, it was turning to white and create a kind of a, a white ball uh, of light. And suddenly it disappeared as the old TV, as the old uh, cathodic tubes, television sets. And we was very kind of <laughs> shock. Hesseman's next step was a psychological evaluation of the main witness and his family dynamics. For this, in February 1997, he invited one of the most respected psychiatrists of the world to Tepotzlan. Professor John E. Mack of the Harvard University, who received the Pulitzer Prize for his biography of Thomas Edward Lawrence and stunned the academic world with his open-minded approach to the alien abduction phenomenon. Experience from Perfecto. the beginning. La sensación a esta altura del plexo solar. I have a sensation, sensación in my solar plex. De amor. Yeah. I have this feeling of love in my solar plex. Me despierta. It wakes me up in the milking or whatever. And he had to cross some other um, lands to get to his. So he said, all of a sudden, daylight, like daylight. And he said, uh, uh, something, which time was like the most, like, um, beautiful or the most, wow, you know, ooh, that's a special one, you know, like the most special time. ¿Cuál vez ha sido, de todas las veces que has visto ovnis, cuál es la que más te ha impresionado, la que más te haya causado así una sensación de wow? Así de repente se volteó, abajo era plateado y arriba dorado. Yeah, it was going that way, and he yeah. said, and the upper part was golden, and in the bottom was uh, silvery. Uh -huh. And what did you think when you saw that? ¿Y qué pensaste cuando viste? Where do you think it came from? You don't know. 
you imagine? Where do you imagine it? Te puedes imaginar. No. No te puedes imaginar muy bien. Lleno del espacio. Ah, step from space. From space, ¿eh? Lo más emocionante. Todos han sido emocionantes. They've all been exciting. They've all been exciting. Pero uno que más te haya impresionado. When we visited the Grupo Sol in their camp up there in the mountains, suddenly a bright, very intense light appeared. One of the researchers saw it, a bright orange-colored light. It was moving up and down very fast like the light of an EKG. After a short while, another, even more intense light appeared over the mountain. It was orange-colored, and it slowly came down. Esa luz subió, subió así, y ahí se estuvo así, mientras que pasaban los, el otro disco anaranjado por, por, por esta parte y los, y y los, los otros, otros por allá. Este, se hizo más chiquita, pero después encendió y se fue bajando lentamente, hasta que llegó al mismo lugar de donde salió, y ahí se quedó, pero muy pequeño. Very important for as witnesses for the quality and truthfulness and sincerity and genuineness of their father as a human being. And that is very powerful testimony. In other words, you, you be you with those boys and you cannot believe and you see their relationship to their father. And you cannot believe that uh, they are children of, of a man who is uh, a dissimulator. When Dr. Meg showed him a photo taken by Diaz, his neighbor remembered seeing the same object several years ago at Elk Single, the very same place where Carlos took the photo. I saw this luminous object. It was enormous. It was about 11 at night. I was with a friend. It was about 12 years ago. It was overwhelming, ten times bigger than the moon. It came towards us, then it turned and it left towards the next village. It was enormous, the same shape, the same colors, very big, enormous. I saw one up there near our house. It was a disc, round, the colors of the sun, orange, yellow, bigger than the moon, also with some red in it. He said he's seen flying saucers. They rest up on the mountains. In lo feo. In qué? In lo más feo. In lo más feo. In the worst parts of the mountain. Sí, como este sí. Sí. He says yes. He's seen. That's what he's seen. Sí. La luz, la luz que se ve. Sí. Es como este color. The light that you can see is it's this color. Aquí el cerro, allá en la punta, para que para uno una luz. Up there in the mountain, uh, white light stops up there on the mountain. And then over there on that other peak. The color. The has three colors. No, 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 A light uh, came down. Era de noche? Sí. A light came down into the mountain from the sky. About 11:30 at night. Este, al al descender, se ve realmente como que levantó una polvadera muy grande. Una polvadera. And as it came down onto the mountain, it looked like it raised a lot of dirt dust. Posteriormente, se vio claramente una 
rampa de luces. It had like a bunch of lights. Uh, ¿Qué colores? De diferentes colores. There were a bunch of different colors. No exactamente así con el color. He said. He said the same shape and more or less the same sh colors. For several days, Professor Meg carefully interviewed Carlos Diaz, his wife Margarita, his two sons, Carlito and Alejandro, and dozens of citizens of Tepotzlan before he came to an assessment of the case. Having spent, uh, well, two, uh, really two and a half days with him and his family, uh, uh, I think he's a credible witness. He calls himself a witness, and he doesn't like to be called a contactee or abductee. He's a witness, and he's a, a credible witness. I haven't found anything about him that would uh, lead one to believe that he would uh, make up a story or uh, doctor photographs or tapes. He's, uh, he appears to um, be about uh, what he says he is, a, a kind of um, visionary experiencer. What impressed you most during the three days? What convinced you most of the authenticity of the case? Well, mainly spending time with him and his family and uh, getting to know him and, uh, and Margarita and the boys and just feeling that this is a, a man not capable of the kind of uh, dissimulation uh, which, uh, of which he's been accused. And by dissimulation I mean uh, faking photographs, faking videos. I'm not technically competent to, to assess those uh, aspects of the work, but he doesn't seem to me someone that uh, uh, would uh, be inclined to do that or motivated to do that. He's not someone who's very good at looking after his own financial interests, for instance. He's still quite poor. Uh, they're finishing up a room in their home. Uh, he uh, has, uh, with all the unusual material he has, he's profited little, little from it. If anything, he's been uh, um, overly generous with his own uh, um, creative material in the belief, rather naive belief, that uh, if he just shares his truth that uh, it will be uh, taken in in a, in a wholesome way. It seems like a um, caring, sincere family man and uh, um, not somebody given to lying, distorting, fraudulent behavior, this kind of thing. It, it seems almost unthinkable, having gotten to know him as well as we have in these days, that, that he would be uh, capable of that. This is exactly the impression his neighbors had of Carlos Diaz, as the former Presidente Municipal, the mayor of Tepotzlan, confirmed to us. I think we all here believe in the story of Carlos Diaz. He's a good man. His work is very serious. And I think he is doing his job very well. What he photographed was seen by us many times. Did you ever hear anybody reporting about Carlos carrying models, lambs, any indication that he might fight the material? No, I don't believe that. There's no way this could be possible, since nobody ever reported anything, and we ourselves have seen the very same object in different times and occasions, so we know that this kind of machine really exists. I saw Carlos and his camera when he videotaped one light in the sky. It is good that he is working with his camera, that he films these objects in the sky. It's good that Carlos is working with the video machine to videotape these objects. 
In this last 18, four years that Carlos has been having his contacts and taking pictures and videos, I have never seen anything that would make me think that he is faking anything. From a human point of view, uh, really Carlos seems uh, a honest person with a normal life, a normal family um, and normal problems. And uh, if, uh, and as uh, Guido Ferrari said, if he is an oxer, we don't understand anything uh, as far as uh, psychology of witnesses is concerned. What convinced you most that the Carlos Diaz case is real? Himself. He's a so simple man. He's a very nice, honest. He's very honest. He's a very good friend. He's a very good father, very loving, very caring for his family. He's very humble. He doesn't have a penny to create a hoax on this kind of case. He would need, besides the, the complicity of many people, he would need a lot of money. He doesn't have money for tomorrow. You know? And besides, he's not interested in money. What he's interested in is giving his message out, telling people, that uh, the earth or planet is dying.